Welcome to Preaching That Matters. A place you can find apostolic Pentecostal preaching. A place where all generations can be fed with the Word of God. We hope you enjoy. Turn around, shake somebody's hand, smile real big, and you can be seated. When I look upon all the things you made, and I listen to all that wind and rain, just remember that I am here today. Tomorrow I could fly away. The life I live held by brittle thread. Nothing matters but the word you said. Never alone will you have to be. I'll walk with you through eternity and tell you never. Jesus, he always, always walks beside me and tells me never alone. Oh, my night's dark, days are long, but Jesus never leaves me alone. I've watched storms as they pass, lives they change, the melting of a heart when it's weeping like rain. And I've really wondered at times if a storm waits for me in the middle of a night. Or on the deep of a sea, but listen, on the crest of a wave, I know he'll appear, nothing matters, but that voice I hear saying, never alone will you have to be. Why, I'll walk and I'll walk with you through eternity and tell you never alone. Oh, my Jesus, he always, always walks beside me and tells me never alone oh my nights are dark days are long my nights are dark and my days are long sometimes nights are dark days are long but Jesus never leaves me alone he tells me alone oh my Jesus he I know he always always walks beside me and tells me never alone oh my nights are dark my days are long but Jesus never leaves me alone. Woo!
Oh, hallelujah. Aren't you glad you got a friend like Jesus? Clap your hands to the Lord. I told the church in center the other night, just like I've told the church here. I said, if you can't have church by yourself, amen, I dare say that you're a real worshiper. Every now and then, it's just you and Jesus. I mean, it's good to have the church. I'm not, I'm not taking away from that. It's good to have the choirs. It's good to have the singing. But sometimes when you're alone in that automobile and you're driving along, it's just you and Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. What a friend I have in Jesus tonight. Well, if you'll stand with me, I'll read in your hearing a few verses of Scripture. Trust the Lord will say something to us. I would like to take a moment here also while you're looking in Acts chapter 27, about verse 28, to say that I am thrilled to have Brother and Sister Whitehead coming along, amen, and taking the reins as pastor of Abundant Life. I feel very confident that God is going to use their leadership to take this church to even a higher place and a greater revival than we've ever seen in times gone by. Amen. Can you say praise the Lord? Amen. That's it. Thank God. And I do feel good in the Holy Ghost. Amen. I, uh, not a lot of churches have the blessing of someone coming in and spending some time and uh, being able to acclimate to the church body and being able to get to know families and fall in alongside of them and carry the burden that they're carrying. But God has blessed us with a great couple, and I want you to know they have my full support. And uh, if I'm here, I may be on the platform, but I may be sitting right there. I may be sitting over there. I thought that was pretty neat what Brother Whitehead said today. I may come back and sit by you. I, I may just do that. Praise the Lord. That would be fun. Amen. Because I've always stood here looking out there, but I would love to come and sit by you and worship with you. So don't be surprised if you don't look around and I'm sitting right by you. And I'm saying, what do you say? Let's give it all we got. Let's just have church. <laughs> Amen. Glory. We're going to have a good time around abundant life. We're going to have a good time. Amen. I may be gone from time to time, but when I'm gone, as the Apostle Paul said, even in my absence, amen, I know that you're going to continue. And uh, I've had different preachers ask me, well, if you're retired, would you consent to come and just preach a weekend? Well, I probably will from time to time. This is my home church. This is where I'll be working. And uh, I'm eligible to do anything. Amen. I'm still, I can clean a commode. I can mow the grass. I can paint. I can do anything. And I'm not above doing it. Praise the Lord. As long as I'm alive, I feel like any and everything I'm capable of doing, I want to serve the kingdom of God. I'm reading here of a particular time in uh, the life of the Apostle Paul, one of my favorite settings. It has to do with the time when Paul is being sent to Rome to stand before Caesar, and he has been transferred to the second ship, and here on this second ship, they are in a storm, and the Bible tells me they've been in that storm for some time. I think it was 14 days. And in those days, they would do what they call sounding. They would drop a weight in the ground, and they, this particular rope had so many knots in it, so many fathoms, so many lengths that were determined by the knots. And they'd drop that weight into the ocean, and the weight would go down. And when it struck the bottom of the ocean, then they would measure the depth by the number of knots that would slip through their hands. And in this particular time, they were looking for land. They had not seen sun nor moon for a long time. And so they're just hoping they're getting close to some solid ground. And they sounded and found it 20 fathoms. And when they'd gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 15 fathoms. Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea under color, as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship. 
Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, now listen, except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. Then the Bible said in verse 32, then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and they let her fall off. I want to use as a simple subject this afternoon, simply entitled, Abide in the Ship. <clears throat> Amen. Abide in the Ship. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reading of the Word. We thank you, Lord, for the leadership that you've placed in this church. In every department, we have men and women that are dedicated to the kingdom of God. We believe, Lord, that you're doing a work in the Holy Ghost in this church. And we're going to see greater numbers Fill with the Holy Ghost. Oh, hallelujah. We believe, Lord, in growth spiritually and physically. Now, bless, I pray, amen, as we endeavor to minister in the Holy Ghost. And everybody said, in Jesus' name, clap your hands unto the Lord before you're seated. Praise God. The Lord bless you. You may be seated. I thought as I was coming to the pulpit, I, one of the songs I sang when I first came to Gladewater, and I don't know why, it just happened to be a popular song at the time, but I didn't think it would fit tonight, but I thought about something I'd done when I first came, and then I thought about something maybe I preached when I first came. Somebody told me Brother Spears tonight in Shreveport is preaching the same message he preached there 30 years ago. Now, Sister Mitty, if you need to move over, just move over. Don't worry about that, son. You ain't going to bother me. Get up. In fact, you can set a chair right here if you'd like. Praise God. We believe in being comfortable. That's the only thing I did wrong. Well, no, I did lots of things wrong, but one of the things was putting that glass up there. Amen. You ought to see our visitors struggle when that's hitting them in the face. But the song I sang when I first came here was I've Got Leaving on My Mind. <laughs> I didn't think that would fly tonight, so <clears throat> I thought I'd just reach back and get never alone. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> hmm. But I don't have leaving on my mind. In this particular account of Scripture, the hope and the salvation of these 100 plus souls that are on this ship have been there for 14 days and night. The clouds are dark, the sky is dark, there's no sun or moon. People are becoming very, very. Uh, very scared and frightened by the fact that they realize this could be the end of their life. But they are sensing that they are drawing closer to land. Now, I have known of men that have actually said, Brother Billy Barrett, that when they got back to America and they came on to the terra firma of what we call the good old USA, that those men have actually literally got on their knees and kissed the ground. I've known and seen pictures of prisoners of war that were delivered from imprisonment back in the 70s, 74, somewhere around there. Some of our Navy flyers that were taken hostage and lived out several years in the what they called the infamous Hanoi Hilton, which was nothing more than a prison camp. But when they were set free and they got back to America, I mean unabashedly, unashamedly, when they got off of that plane, they came down the steps before they even saw their wife or greeted their kids, and they got on the ground, Brother Greg, and they just kissed the ground. They were so glad to be here. Amen. I remember flying to the Philippines one time, and when we came back, we got in a storm, and, and back in those days, the 747 was the biggest plane that flew, and, and I looked out the windows, amen, Sister Stacy, and it looked like an old seagull. The wings were doing this. That is no exaggeration. They would go up, bang, and they'd go up and bang. And some of you I know have flown in such places. And, and I remember sitting there. The only thing that kept me in my sane mind was the fact that I got to laughing. Maybe it was my insanity, but I got to laughing because I was watching people's drinks go clear out of their cups, go up in the air, and then come right back down and set in their cups. And I saw people grabbing the glad bags, you know, and uh, they were opening them up and uh, filling them up with donuts and uh, recycled coffee and, and everything else. And I was just thanking God that I wasn't sick. And uh, I got tickled and got to laughing at their demise. And somehow or another, I got through the storm with laughter. <laughs> the joy of the Lord was my salvation. Praise God. And, uh, but I remember I was so glad when we got to the halfway point there in, uh, in Hawaii. <clears throat> 
and landed at customs and got out. My legs were just a little bit wobbly. <laughs> but I was certainly glad to be on solid ground. There's something about us as human beings. There's a certain sense of security and safety when we know we're standing on something solid. Amen. The atmosphere of our world, both politically and socially, economically, in every sense, is being challenged in every respect. Amen. Never before have we seen life in such a squeeze and such a stressful point, and we're looking for something solid today. And I've been sounding as I've been listening to Brother Norvell teach and preach the Word of God concerning the soon coming of our Lord. And after sounding, Brother Norvell, I can tell you I feel like we're getting close to land. Amen. It can't be that far away. <laughs> Whoa. Praise God. Heaven can't be that far away. I just feel like we're getting closer and closer with every lesson that we're able to hear and all the teaching, amen, that we're receiving uh, through Brother Norvell in our class on Monday night. I'm come to understand that land is not that far away. And, and I'd love to get something solid under my feet. I would love to feel something that's unshakable, something that, amen, affirms the fact that everything is going to be all right. Praise the Lord. Amen. There's some people that if they walked out of here with only one message in their heart, they would feel their time was spent well. And that was to leave here knowing that everything is going to be all right. <clears throat> Praise God. Everything is going to be all right, no matter how dark it is. No matter how tumultuous the times are, <clears throat> everything, amen, is going to be all right. And so they sounded and they said, it seems as though we're getting close to safety and we're getting close to hope. And the scripture, and I'll not take time to read it again, but the Bible says that, amen, during this time, there were those that went under color. Now that is an old English expression simply to say they went, amen, and they did that disguising their motives, disguising their intent. They went as though they were letting out anchors when in truth they were letting down a lifeboat out of the side of that ship, and they were going to take matters into their own hands, and they were going to flee for safety to some land they believed was somewhere out there in the abyss and the fog of that dark night. <clears throat> Now, if I would retract for just a moment, and this is important to understand the context of what I'm going to say. Only a few verses earlier, if you'll back up just a little bit, I think about Acts 22, verse 22. If you'll back up there just a little bit, the Bible said the angel of the Lord came to see the apostle Paul in this ship that was in the storm. And the Lord gave him a promise. And he said, Paul, I want you to know this one thing. He said, there's not going to be any loss of any life. Amen. You can take that to the bank. There's not anybody on this ship, prisoner or soldier, that is going to be lost. Everybody is going to get through this. Amen. Now, he said, but now there is going to be some destruction. But he said, the only thing that's going to be lost are those things that are on this ship and the ship itself. Amen. But the lives and the souls of men and women... He said, I'm going to give you a promise. Just hang on. It's going to be okay. Amen. You may not understand how it's all going to unfold. And you may wonder how you're going to get to land because the ship you're living in right now is going to be destroyed by the intensity of this storm. But no one understand this, Paul. I make you a promise. Everybody on this ship is going to get out of here. Amen. But they've got to stay on the ship. Hallelujah, they got to stay on the ship, praise God. Amen, the ship is going to be lost, but everyone's going to be saved. Isn't it amazing how God stu does stuff? You know, I wonder sometimes, why don't he just make it a little bit, you know, plainer sometimes so I can really understand how this is all going to unfold. But he says, the ship's going to go kapoof, but you're going to be all right. In other words, I'm going to pull the rug out from under you, but don't worry, you're going to be okay. Amen. And there's a bunch of them saying, but I don't swim. And he said, but that's okay. I'm not a swimmer. I'm not a water person, but that's okay. Amen. You're going to get to the place of safety because I'm making you a promise. But he said that promise is contingent upon this one thing. And that is your willingness to stay with this ship. Just stay in this ship. 
Amen. But the scripture tells us uh, that his advice was ignored. Amen. And the scripture says that there were men that decided we're going to take things uh, into our own hands. What I want you to know and I wanted the men of this story to know, God is about to do a work of grace. God's about to do a work of grace. And I know nothing doesn't seem to add up, but I want you to hear me. You're going to get to land. But you've got to stand on my word. You've got to trust me that what I know what I'm doing, and I'm doing the right thing. <clears throat> May not make a lot of sense to you, but he said, I want you to trust me and realize grace is about to work. Amen. Nobody's going to get through this, and nobody's going to be the recipient of this grace unless they obey my commandment. I do not believe that those men who tried to escape in that smaller boat, my friend, would have ever made it safely to land. For God had told Paul, you tell everybody just to stay in the ship. The best thing that ever happened to those men is when Paul saw them trying to put that boat in the water. And he turned and he spoke to those soldiers. And he said, if those guys do what I think they're about to do, and if they follow through with what they're trying and attempting to do, he said, nobody's going to be saved. He said, matter of fact, you're going to be lost. Everybody is contingent, amen, contingent upon staying inside this boat. Then the Bible said the soldiers went forward. The soldiers were the sailors that actually operated the boat were trying to leave the boat and leave everybody at the mercy of the storm. And the scripture says that the soldiers ran forward and they cut her loose. Now I want to stop right here for just a moment and tell you I believe what the Bible says. And God will add to the church daily such as should be saved. I want you to know you're in this church right now because God drew you here. It wasn't because, amen, through your thinking or your ability or your wisdom that you got to this church. The hand of God. Jesus said, no man cometh unto the Father except my spirit draw him. So I am believing in my heart that if God put me here, if God brought you into this church, do you hear what I'm saying? It's a God thing that you're here. And God's not going to bring you into any place that God's not going to take care of you. My faith is this this afternoon is that God brought me here. I think I need to do my best just to stay here. And stay in the boat. Can somebody say praise the Lord? Hallelujah. It was no accident that Paul was transferred to that second boat. The first boat had a name omitted day for or something. I can't remember it exactly. Could pronounce it even though I could spell it. The second boat or the second ship was the ship of Alexandria. And it had an objective of going to Rome. Amen, to fulfill the calling of the Apostle Paul to stand before Caesar and preach this glorious gospel. For the Bible said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached into all the world. That means even those that are in government, even those that are in positions of authority, this gospel shall be preached. Hallelujah. I'll just digress for a moment and say that it thrills my soul Amen, her sister Stacy and her group are connected to Abundant Life because I also believe this is a facet of ministry of this church that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached into all areas of leadership. Amen, I believe that is the will of God. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. Our legislators, they need to hear the gospel. Amen, our senators need to hear the gospel. Amen, Brother Norvell and his broadcast and his ministry sends a beautiful magazine a periodically every year to every congressman and every senator uh, that's in Washington reminding them that Jesus is coming. We're drawing close to land, my friend. And the last thing I want to do is get out of the boat. 
The last thing I want to do is get out of the ship. I want you to know who my captain is. His name is Jesus Christ. I may be lost, but he's never lost. I may not know what's going on, but he knows the end from the beginning. Hallelujah to God. He's sailing us to the port of our divine destiny. Thank God. I thought when the scripture says those soldiers cut that boat off, amen, and let it fall into the water. I said to myself, Brother Honey, today when I was reading this again, I prepared it last night, but I was reading it again today, my brother, and I said, God, help me to get rid of every option. I want to stay with the boat. I want to stay with the ship. Amen, I know some folks want to find other ways and other means, uh, amen, to paddle their own boats and find their own security and their own safety. But I want to tell you there's one church, uh, and it's a blood-washed, blood-bought church uh, full of the Holy Ghost, baptized uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, Amen, and I want to be in that boat. Uh, I want to be in that ship. Uh, Amen, there's no lifeboats uh, attached to this great ship of Zion because she's not going under. She's going to fulfill the mission that God has for her until you hear him say, come away, my fair one. Enter into the joys of the Lord. You've been faithful over a few things. Uh, I'll make you ruler over many, hallelujah, hallelujah. I was called into this. God brought me into this. I don't think God makes mistakes. I don't think I need to second guess what God is doing. Amen. I want you to know I'm in this heart, body, and soul. I'm in this ship. I'm sailing. I'm staying. Praise God. I want it to sail into the portals of glory. God put a church in the world so we would have a place of safety and salvation. But there's coming a time, yes, uh, when the physical sense uh, of a literal building and pews and lights uh, and programs are going to be done away with uh, and we're going to worship at the feet of Jesus Christ. Uh, Oh, hallelujah to God. What a day that's going to be. But I'll tell you what, let's stay in the boat. I said let's stay in the ship. Let's abide in the ship, hallelujah to God. Amen. You know that was true because you've heard me preach that message in verse 44. And some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship, but they all made it safe to land. I don't know how much grace you're going to need to be saved, but if you'll stay in the ship, God's going to save a piece of it just for you. Amen, I said some on broken pieces. If you'll stay with the ship until God's through, uh, amen, with what we call the ecclesial body that's in the world, if you'll stay in it until the trumpet sounds, uh, God's going to see that there's enough grace that whatever you need, you're going to make it all the way safe to land. I don't care who you are, how knowledgeable you are, how spiritual you are or unspiritual you are. Yeah. God, hallelujah, I don't care how you fall in the list, amen, and the ratings of spirituality, amen, the main thing is stay in the boat, stay in the boat, I said stay in the boat, stay in the boat until God's through with it, and when he's through, he's going to see to it that there's enough grace to get you to the other side, let's give him some praise for that. You know what? Even the guys that were trying to abandon their responsibility and jump out of the boat before time were still saved. Friend, that's grace. <laughs> I, I'd, I'd have probably done it different. I'd have, you'd have read it, and if I'd have done it, it would have probably said, yay, and all of those men that tried to escape early, they drowned in the sea, but everybody else made it. And we'd all just, you know, said, well, that they got their just desserts. Let me tell you something. There's times in all of our lives when we want to drop another boat into the water and try to paddle our little way. 
Amen. Because we feel like maybe things just don't look right. It don't feel right. Hey, man, we've been in this thing. We don't know straight up from sideways, north, south, east, or west. Uh, we just know we've been pitching and turning. Uh, hey, man, and we're seasick. And my God, where is God? We haven't felt God. We haven't seen God. Amen. But then the Lord drops down, gets a hold, and anoints his mouthpiece and says, stay in the boat. Uh, abide in the ship. Uh, amen. The ship is going to come apart at a time, but there'll be no loss of any man's life. Uh, amen. Just hang on to this ship uh, until God starts custom making her amen into a great ministry of grace did you hear why did you hear what I just said I said you just hang in here the church is not full of perfect people the church is full of people that just won't quit did you hear what I said I said the church is not full of perfect people. The church is full of people that said I'm just going to hang in there. I'm just going to stay in the boat until God gets me to where I need to go. Clap your hands unto the Lord and thank him. And I know for years I've seen individuals for reasons they felt justified. Tried to create another way outside of the church. But I'll tell you this, I've never seen it be a success. Many times health and finances and resources and families are lost and not recovered. And there's a lifetime of regrets because somebody decided I think I can paddle my own boat. And so they let a boat down, their family climbed in with them, and away they go. The last time you see them is them disappearing in the misty night beyond the fog of uncertainty. I don't know where they are, but I know where the church is, and I'm going to stay in the church. We're going to be in the same night together, but I'd rather be with Jesus. I'd rather be with the body of Christ. I said, I'd rather be with the body of Christ. Uh, amen. I don't want to be caught paddling my own boat in the middle and the thick of a midnight of uncertainty. I know somebody said, well, it can't be that far. It can't be that far. We've sounded it, and it looks like we're getting close. I think I can paddle my way the rest of the way in. Hey, friend, in the 11th hour, I'm not taking any chances. I said, I've come this far. I'm not taking any chances. I'm not going to drop another boat in the water and try to make it on my own. I've come for the last 42 years in this church, and by the help and the grace of God, I'm going to be here when the trumpet sounds or when my body's resting in front of this pulpit. I'm going to stay with the church. I'm telling you today, if you've got another boat, then cut it loose. If you've got another option, then cut it loose. Put your heart and mind in the will of God and commit yourself to the church of Jesus Christ. Let's praise him for that. Hallelujah. This is going to be a work of grace. It's going to be a work of grace. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding in all thy ways. Acknowledge him. And he shall direct thy path. Get up every morning and say, Jesus, you know the way. I'm leaning on you, Lord. I'm limited in my understanding, perception of what is awaiting me tomorrow. But I know if my hand is in yours, everything is going to be all right. Lean not to your own understanding. If you're considering paddling another boat, the best thing you could do is cut her loose and let her fall into the sea and stay with the church. I said stay with the church. I said stay with the church. Stay in the body of Christ. Stay with the gospel. Stay with the preaching of truth. Hallelujah. You've heard me say this. I say it again because I believe in it. I believe it to be true. If you get in another boat and paddle your own boat, you may realize the magnitude of your mistake, and you may make it back. But there's no guarantee your wife will make it back. There's no guarantee your husband will make it back. There's no guarantee your children are going to make it back. Some of us are beholden to decisions of the past that if God would allow us to go back and redo them, we would redo them tonight. 
because we realize the long-lasting consequences of a bad decision. In a moment of weakness and frustration, even when we're thinking only about ourselves. We weren't thinking about our kids. I know we love our children. We say we love our children. But I happen to know when it comes right down to it, the flesh can take over. And we'll operate in a vein that is simply only is self-serving. Feeling is perhaps maybe we have justified our decisions by doing a particular thing going a particular direction, letting down a boat of another persuasion, and going out into the night with our little family of four or five or friends or associates. We may realize the magnitude of our mistake and be able to make it back, but I have seen this happen over and over and over again, and it is true. Most families as a whole never make it back. What is the answer, Pastor? Abide in the ship. Bring your little darlings to the house of God. Get them in the Sunday school class. Bring your family into the house of God. Folks, we're listening and seeing garbage all around us. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and we only come to the house of God for a period of about two hours, amen, a service. That's the only time that we have the input of the preaching of the word and the atmosphere of the Holy Ghost, uh, amen, to uh, somehow help us in making the right decisions in our life. Uh, we are being peppered with Facebook advertisements and YouTube and televisions and all kinds of periodicals uh, that are pulling us in every direction and frustrating our spirits. Uh, the only time we're able to breathe the fresh air uh, of divine truth uh, is when we come into the house of of God which represents the ship of Zion that's headed to the gates of heaven and so I'm telling you if you ever made up your mind to stick with truth this is the day to stay with it this is the day to commit to it amen your children don't have the maturity to understand the importance of being in the house of God but you've got the responsibility of a parent to determine where they're going to spend their eternity I know, amen, there's things I would do different if I had the opportunity in raising my children. But I can assure you of this one thing. There were some things that were non-negotiable. We didn't have any other lifeboats. There were no other little boats attached to the main boat. Amen, that if things didn't go our way, we were going to jump in the small boat and we are going to paddle off into the distance somewhere. No, no, when it came time for church, we went to our church. We had church. We went to the house of God. There were some things that were just simply non-negotiable. Amen. And I know my two girls are not perfect. They've had their mistakes just like their daddy, and we've all got them. But I'm happy to tell you she's sitting right over here with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, ready to work her heart out, amen, for this church and for this congregation. I believe that with all of my soul. That did not just happen. I give credit to her mother. Amen. Also give credit to the fact, amen, that I made up my mind some years ago. Amen. She was not above a paddling every now and then. Now she's too big for me to paddle today. I don't know when the last time I paddled her. It must have been way back there in grade school or something. Amen. But I didn't, I didn't hold back. I did it, I did it with love. <clears throat> Amen, I did it because I wanted her to change. Amen, I did the same thing with her sister. Praise the Lord. But there was more than paddling. Amen, we spent hours and hours and weeks and days in the house of God together. I don't fault you for going and doing whatever you're financially able to do. But let me just tell you this. <clears throat> We spent the whole month of June in the house of God nearly every year for 13 years. We went to camps and camp meetings. My children were raised in the shadow of the house of God. Church was our life. 
And I wished I could have given them more. I wished I could have taken them to some of the, some of the great sites around the world. Had the money to fly them to every corner of the globe. But I couldn't do that. But I'll tell you what I did. I took them to the house of God. And I said in the summertime we're going to church uh, and we're working every day in the work of God. Uh, We're going to pray in the altars. Uh, We're going to pray for young people. We're going to preach the gospel. And I'm standing here to tell you I don't regret one day I ever spent uh, with my family in this great ship of Zion. We're still on our way to heaven. (laughs) We didn't have much money back then. Our vacation was general conference. General conference is you get there, you get in your room, you go to church. You stay in church all day, you go home, you change clothes, get up next morning and you go to church. (laughs) Yeah, you see a lot of country going there and coming back, but when you get there, you go to church. You listen to preaching and singing and worshiping and praying and oh my God. No, I never did have the opportunity to take her some of the great scenic places in America. Amen. But I took her to the ship. And I said, walk about Zion. (laughs) Study her bulwarks. Look at it. It brought your grandparents all the way, amen, to a place of salvation. And they're resting in the arms of the Almighty God. And that same ship will take you to that beautiful place called heaven if you'll just stay in it. Don't let anybody talk you out of it. I know they say there's fun over here and there's excitement over there and something back over there, but honey, don't let them talk you out of that ship. Uh, You stay in the boat. Uh, You stay in the boat. You stay in the boat. I don't care what Facebook looks like. I don't know how much a good time everybody looks like they're having. There's nothing wrong with having a good time, but you need to make sure that church uh, and living for God is your number one priority. I said that's your number one priority. I'm saying let's stay with the ship. Uh, I say if there's any options, let's just cut her loose. Uh, I say let's get rid of them. Uh, Let's let the Lord know from right now, amen, we started this thing and we plan to finish. Uh, Can somebody say hallelujah? Oh, give the Lord some praise. Hallelujah. I really think in my heart, Grace moved in such a way that it eliminated a bad decision. I pray that God's extensive grace will reach across this church because every one of us are human beings. And at times we feel so tested and tried and so frustrated at things. Sometimes we just want to take a different direction. But just to make sure that doesn't happen, cut loose the options. Get rid of the thought of ever living another life except for Jesus Christ. I believe that God has a way of protecting us. I remember a particular gentleman was sharing with me his frustration while he was trying to get to the airport one day. He said, I was so frustrated. I was running late. And he said, wouldn't you know it? He said, I got in a traffic jam. Somebody had a wreck. He said, I was looking at my clock. I knew I was barely going to make it if I got to the gate on time. It'd be a miracle. I was rushing through the traffic, and then he said it just seemed like I couldn't get there. I was late driving into the airport. I parked my car. I ran into the the terminal. Amen. I told him I need to get to the gate as quick as possible. They said there's a good chance you won't make it. He said I ran down the halls. I got to where the gate was, and when I ran up, they were closing the door. He said the plane was backing off from the terminal. He said I don't mind telling you I was mad. I was mad at everybody that got in my way while I was trying to get to that airport. He said, I was angry at the people that was in that car wreck, and I don't even know how they came out, but I was angry. That was not a good time for them to have a wreck like they picked it, you know. He said, I said, well, I might as well see if I can get another flight. They said, there'll be another one, but it'll be another hour and a half. You might as well go get a meal. He said, so I went to the restaurant. I was sitting there eating my meal. About an hour later, when across the top of the television, there came a little banner. Flight so-and-so, so-and-so has disappeared. He said, later, I saw the pictures of a smoldering wreckage of a plane, and it was the plane I was supposed to be on. Grace just stepped in and said, cut her loose. 
He's not going that route. He's going to stay in the ship. That's how much I believe in the arm of God. I'm frustrated sometimes. You get frustrated. We get angry at life. It doesn't seem to be fair. But I thank God there's one that's showing oversight. That's looking beyond our foolishness and sometimes our stupidity and ignorance. And he says, they don't even know what they're wishing for. He said, I'm going to get in their way. I'm going to hold them back. I'm not going to allow them to make that decision. Amen. And then he speaks a divine word and says, cut her loose. They're not going that way. I pray in the Holy Ghost, Lord, I know I'm a human being. And I know I can make some foolish decisions and do some stupid things. But I'm asking you, please, cut every option away from my life. Don't ever let me get to a place that think, you know, I've come this far. I think I can finish it okay without God. I can finish it okay without the church. We're not far from land. All I got to do is just mind my business and just, I don't need the church. I don't have to be there in every service. Now, I'm, I'm going to sit out here, step out here and say something right now. And, and I trust that there's no ministers anywhere watching or listening to this that, that this uh, <clears throat> is directed to them. I may be retired as a minister, as a pastor, but not as a minister. I may be a retired pastor, but I believe every pastor should be a Christian. And the Bible said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves, amen, to the house of God as the manner of some is. I talked to someone the other day, and they said, brother so-and-so said, yeah, he's retired. I said, have you seen him? He said, well, no, he hardly ever comes around anymore. I'm not coming to church for a paycheck. I got the Holy Ghost. God put something in my heart that when the door is open and I'm in town, honey, I'm coming down that aisle, I'm sitting on this pew, or I'm going to sit right next to you, and we're going to have church, hallelujah. I'm not coming because I'm the pastor. I'm coming because I'm a child of God, and this ship is headed to heaven. Stand to your feet and clap your hands unto him right now. Oh, come on, let's give God some glory and give him some praise. If I, as a retired pastor, retiring as a pastor, not retiring from the ministry, but if I would allow myself to say, you know what, you've preached for 50 years, you've pastored for 42, you've been there every time that the door's been open." You've been there when a lot of those folks haven't been there. You always knew you had to show up and you were there. You deserve just to sit back and prop your feet up. I gotta be, I've talked to a lot of retired people here in the last week or two, and they're probably listening here. So, fellas, I hope we can, I hope we can still be friends, but I'm just going to preach my heart here. I can't be saved without a preacher I don't care if I have preached 50 years I need to have a church I need to be in that church and I need somebody pointing their finger towards me and saying you need to live for God my flesh does not cease to live because I'll be 71 Tuesday afternoon that doesn't even seem right, Sister Billy. I know. I went to the mirror the other day and looked at myself and I said, can you believe you're 70 years old? And that face looked back at me and said, no, I don't believe it at all. So in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. <laughs> it just came all of a sudden. I get up one morning and Voila, here I am. 70 years. The last 10 years have flown by so quickly, so quickly. 
And the next 10 are going to go very, very quickly. I may not live to be 80 years old. I feel great tonight. I feel healthy. But I've got a pastor friend. His wife is the same age as myself. She had a stroke last night. She's paralyzed over half of her body. So I'm not getting out of this world scot-free. This old vessel was not made to weather the storms of life. The only way I can make it is to stay in this boat. Stay in this ship. So I'll keep singing. it. Holding on to Jesus. Could we just come and stand around the front? And would you honor me by just standing around the front and 